I do want to quickly transition to our fireside chat led by Bill Allison, uh, our CTO. Bill, will you take it away? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we have a full agenda and uh, Anthony, you are keeping us all on track. Uh, hang on and let me go into my uh, fireside chat room. And then why don't we um, take down the slides and I will introduce our special guest uh, for the fireside chat. So it is Abby, I will give you a, a spotlight here. Okay, good. I don't know how to. All right, good. So there we are. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce you all to Abby Kearns, the CTO of Puppet. Uh, Puppet's one of the pioneer companies in DevOps and infrastructure automation at Puppet. Uh, Abby's in charge of the vision and direction and the overall enterprise product portfolio, the product that we use here right in Berkeley IT. Uh, before that, Abby was the executive director of Cloud Foundry Foundation, where she led their vision, drove the development of the open source product uh, project, le leading to its widespread adoption in industry. Uh, she led product development of cloud services at Verizon and earlier in her career had operations roles at Totality EDS and Sabre. You remember that from... Uh, the spinoff of American Airlines. I'm thrilled to have Abby at this meetup so we can hear from someone who really gets infrastructure, which is the world in which many of us live inside Berkeley IT. Um, this is the first time we've done a fireside chat format, um, and this is an inclusive open community. So if you want to ask something, you can either chat your question, raise your hand, and Amy and I and Anthony will keep an eye out for you. Uh, we do ask that you keep questions brief, i.e. make them questions, uh, to allow more time for people to participate. So that said, let's jump right in. Um, Abby, you know, how did you decide to make a career in infrastructure? As all, everyone did in infrastructure by accident. Um, so it was uh, also, first I have to start off, I have to give a shout out to Skydeck. I love everything that Caroline has done at Skydeck. I'm an advisor there and I'm a big fan of all the startups that go through there. Um, also, thank you for having me, Bill. I feel like we should coordinate it on the fire backdrop. Just yeah, I emailed you too. Food for thought next time. Food for thought next time. We'll coordinate. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did. I like everyone else in enterprise infrastructure. I kind of fell into the job. I um, uh, after I graduated from college in uh, uh, the late '90s, um, early 2000s, I was looking for my first real job. And uh, I was uh, applying to all the companies. And for those of you that weren't around in the early 2000s in tech, it was a very complicated time to find a job. And uh, not a lot of people were hiring. And I ended up falling into a job as a project manager at Sabre, of all places. And for those of you that don't Sabre, Sabre used to actually be part of American Airlines and just spun out at the end of, I think the 90s or beginning of 2000, right around there, I think at the end of the 90s. And Sabre did all of the reservation systems for American Airlines and eventually broadened to other airlines. And so it owned a lot of the, the res systems, all the things that we do when we book a flight, buy a ticket, have seats, all of that was handled through um, Sabre's infrastructure. But Sabre also managed a lot of the technology solutions for American Airlines, everything that was um, what they called their customer technology. So everything from back then that include email to website, which was early e-commerce when the websites first started coming on. And it was, a, it was an interesting time to be at Sabre. And I ended up getting slotted into the global infrastructure, the middleware division and I fell in love with all things having to do with infrastructure and I just have stayed in there ever since. So 21 years later, I'm still doing infrastructure. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, um, you know, you and I have talked about the role of the CTO. When I became mm -hmm. Berkeley's first CTO, I had to give talks about the different flavors of CTO. And so my role here is working across teams, supporting strategy and enterprise architecture, trying to get people to think about the future. What does it mean to be the CTO at Puppet? I mean, it's such a good point, Bill, because CTO is different for every company. Um, and my job as CTO is the strategy piece, the vision where we go in from a product and a technology standpoint, um, but also, um, 
part of my job is as CTO is to do evangelism, both to our customers. Where are we going? Why? What's the big vision? But externally um, to, ex to meetups like this, to press interviews, to analyst briefings, um, to external keynotes. But I also have, um, I'm also one of the rare CTOs that I also run product design and engineering too. So I have a team of about 175 people across those three disciplines that I'm also responsible for. So I'm responsible for not only the vision, but how to execute against it. And so it's, um, it's a good healthy dose of uh, humility on a regular basis. <laughs> Be careful of the ideas you come up with because you're going to have to deliver against them. So, but it's, uh, I, I love it and I have such a fantastic team and it really gives me an opportunity to think through well, what does the journey look like for a company as it evolves and tries to meet the changing demands of the market and the changing demands of the technology stacks. Thanks, Abby. Hey, I see uh, Tara, you have your hand up. Let's, uh, what's your, speak up. Let's hear from you. Yeah, awesome. Hi, Abby. It's super nice to meet you. Um, I'm a student here at Berkeley, so I'm kind of just curious to know about how your academic background kind of influenced you to go down your career path. Ooh, I feel like I'm going to get in trouble with this answer. So um, I will I will also say I'm one of the rare CTOs that actually did major in comp sci, um, although I got a, my final degree ended up being in computer information systems, which you know, y'all can correct me. I don't know if actually is it still a degree anymore. Um, but it's um, it was it was really meant to be a healthy dose of CS with a little bit of smidge of of economics, um, just in the you know in business stuff. But um, here's where I'm gonna probably go astray. Go, go a field of, of the, the demographic here. Meet up is forward. Go for it. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go right. I do not feel that there was anything in my my education that applies to today, with the exception of one thing. And Bill, I told you about this when we caught up. I do feel like so for me when I was in college, I hated to write. If you had me in a class where I had to write long form essays and papers, I hated it. And I try to get out of it whenever I could. The great irony is I spend most of my day writing. So I do feel like college really did a great job of preparing me to write memos and strategy briefs and things like that. But beyond that, I feel like um, I don't know that it is as relevant. And, and here's why I say that. One, we have a massive, massive talent shortage in, in technology jobs across every industry. There are not enough people to fill the open spots today. The, you couple that with the fact that the technology we have right now is evolving very quickly. We're in the process of rewriting everything that got us here today. All the backing technology that you think you know from servers to software that runs those servers to operating systems, all that's being rewritten. And it's being aggressively written, mostly in open source. And that journey started about seven, eight years ago, but it is speeding up every year. So there isn't anyone out there that knows all the technology that exists today. When we think about purely just about even cloud native within the cloud native ecosystem, but more broadly enterprise infrastructure, most there isn't a lot of people that know it all because it's so much. And so you couple those things together and, and with the fact that also we have a very, we'll just say kindly lopsided demographic in technology roles as a whole as well. And so we have a large underserved community of of participants that I think could participate in the workforce that we have today, there's just not an easy on-ramp for them. Specifically, I'm speaking of, of women, gender minorities, BIPOC individuals, people that don't have or haven't had access to either coding schools or college educations that have put them in CS degrees that could slot them into these roles. And as an industry, I think we've leaned over, over aggressively on four-year CS degrees to get into tech roles. And I don't think that's necessary for a lot of the jobs in tech today. And so I would like, for me personally, I do not put four-year degrees as a requirement on my job descriptions. I've taken them off. I think you need to have some experience for some roles, but frankly, I look for aptitude and interest. Are you willing to learn continuously to satisfy your job? And are you willing to, to really understand what's going on more broadly in the ecosystem and the environment at large? And so, this is my long-winded way of saying, I, I don't know that a degree is required per se, 
I do, I do think a four-year college degree, whatever that degree in, does set you up for certain, for a great framework for the way to think, how to, how to think academically, how to write, how to contribute, how to collaborate. I think there's a lot of great foundations and fundamentals that college can provide, but I also don't view it as a requirement to participate in a technology world. Thanks, Abby. I mean, that, that's such a great point. And we've, inside of Berkeley IT, we've given a lot of thought to how, what are the actual requirements of a job and how do we get the most number of people to apply? I mean, even just in looking across various companies to see how they've structured job descriptions. I read job descriptions that I think, oh my gosh, like I'd never be qualified for that job. And I'm relatively, you know, uh, probably am, right? So I think we really do discourage people unnecessarily. Um, what's Puppet doing uh, in that regard to sort of increase the uh, funnel of applicants? We, we have a great feeder programs. Um, uh, into engineering. So we, we take a lot of interns. We also take a lot of or associates fresh out of school. We have a lot of interns that start off at interns and convert to full-time employees once they graduate, both in engineering, product, and design. So I view that as a great opportunity to bring in new and emerging talent. Um, but we also look outside of the box. We've got a lot of, of people in Product, for example, we've had people that have changed from different jobs in uh, from HR, for example, to sales engineer that have converted into our product team over the last year. And it's really about giving people an opportunity. Are you are you interested and ready to hustle? Great, let's talk about that. Are you going to be a senior product manager? No, but can we bring you in, pair you up with someone, and give you the opportunity and the access to learn? Absolutely. And I think um, that's something I highly encourage within our company. That's the value of a company of our size. We're just under 500 people. And one of the values in, in a company of our size is you can try out different jobs. You're like, you know what? I'd really like to be a product manager. How do I do that? Can I talk to you? Um, you know, we have a great mentoring program here as well. Can I, can I, can I work with someone and get mentored and, and try to slot into a job there and learn those skills? And I think if you're interested, we, 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 give, we give a lot of flexibility for people to try things out. Cool. Um, you know, actually, one of the reasons we created this meetup was both to create a positive energy around Berkeley's startup scene and what's going on with research computing and IT, um, but also we've tried to make it a place where there can be continual learning. So a lot of the people that come to the meetup may be new uh, in tech or in learning. So could you explain, like, what is DevOps exactly? And, and what does it mean to you? DevOps is the most overused term next to digital transformation these days. <laughs> I think it's, a, it's like cloud. What does cloud mean? I don't know. It depends on who you ask. It means a lot of different things. I actually, weirdly enough, um, funny story. I gave a talk about seven years ago about why I hate the word DevOps. I actually went to a meetup and gave a whole talk about why I hate DevOps. Um, uh, the great ironies of working at a DevOps company later on. Lesson learned for all of you. Um, be careful about the talks you give that are really strident. <laughs> you may have to eat those things later. But I, I actually still don't like the term DevOps because I think people ascribe it as this utopian way of being. And it's a, you know, it's a high functioning relationship between a developer team and operating team. And I think that's part of it. But at the end of the day, DevOps is really the practice of having a small cross-functional team aligned with this to a single outcome. Usually we say it's a business outcome. Sometimes it can be a feature or a product or a service, but it's a small cross-functional team aligned to an outcome. And that when I talk about cross-function, I mean, it's a developer, it's operators, it's a platform, it's security, it's a product owner. It's potentially a business owner. It's a team of a small team, you know, the, the infamous two pizza, the small two pizza team aligned to a single outcome. And that's the vision. Now, the practical outcome is, is that what, how people really apply that? No, more often than not, it's, it's really heavily reliant on technology to address some of the cultural pieces, but it's largely really referring to the practice and culture and people 
aspect of it, technology and enabler of that outcome. And unfortunately, we're at the point where people start with a technology and then try to like fit the people around it. And, and, and they're like, well, it does. I'm not any faster. I'm not pushing code faster. We're not resilient. We're not scaling faster. And you're like, well, you got to fix the people process part first. The technology will help you glue all of it together. And so what we've really, what has happened is we've ascribed this DevOps. We have people that are DevOps people. There's a job roles at many companies, you're in the DevOps team and you do the DevOps and we have a DevOps practices. And really what it's, it's shorthand of way of saying, we've got some people that are doing the practice, but not all. And the ultimate goal is to really get to that high alignment between all of the teams on that single outcome, because that's when you move fast. Because the goal of DevOps is to move fast without friction, make things easier, and deploy, manage, and deal with your workload really, really quickly. And that's, that's the goal. And backing into that, it's a people and process and a little bit of technology that really enables and engenders that outcome. So I want to pull on this a little bit more um, because Puppet is famous for their state of DevOps report. And the 2021 report came out in the summer and it brought out a point uh, that said that many companies seem stuck and where they get stuck are cultural blockers. And so what's going on in these companies? And you know, and I maybe Berkeley should be included in this. How do we, if we have these cultural blockers, how do we get around them? Like what, what's the recipe? What should we be doing? I mean, it's hard. It, it's, a, it's a hard, hard thing to really deal with because it isn't, where people are getting stuck is, is one of the things we referred to a couple of years ago when we were, you know, when I was at Cloud Foundry, we watched a lot of the digital transformation journeys and we watched the rollout and the evolution and they would hit what we'd call, you know, kind of the chasm. So what you do is you start, when you start with these big transformation journeys, and this applies also at Berkeley, is you start with a small team, right? You got, you got a five people in a room, they're doing POCs, we got some software, we got some hardware, people are moving fast. We're cranking out code, it's amazing. Everyone's excited and you're like, great, let's scale this. We now wanna roll this out. We've got some success, let's scale this out. And then you start to roll it to other teams and it just stops. It runs up against the other team's org structure, communication patterns, uh, company, the ways they work, the expectations they have, you start running up against all of that because what you don't have in place is why does, because you're asking another team of people, you're asking other people to fundamentally change the way they work. And if you've been at a company 20 years, 10 years, hey, I need you to completely change the way you work. Got it? Good. And, and most people are like, wait, what? What, 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 what are we talking about here? Like, oh, I hear you. But they default right back into the way they work. And so when you're talking about doing these highly automated patterns, deploying code, writing cloud native architectures, scaling code, writing to public clouds, or even on-prem. You wanna write code quickly, iterate on that code and get it out into production fast. There's an assumption that you've got, one, you've got highly developed technologies that people can leverage quickly. You've automated a lot of that. So there's not a lot of human controls in there in the meantime, you've, really change the way you communicate amongst the team. So there's high free form, you're democratizing access, you're, you're allowing people to kind of drive their own patterns and develop quickly. You have, this is called out in the state of DevOps report too, you have self-service. So developers can now pull their own, uh, you know, their own infrastructure up. They can deploy on their own to production. They can iterate on their own. You know, all of these things must be true, and most organizations don't have that in place. Most organizations aren't quite ready for that. Bit. So, in a large enterprise like ours, um, I almost feel like is there comfort with an application team running their own infrastructure? And there's almost like you see like an appetite for the organization to spin up a infrastructure as a service service in the service catalog. Like, how would you how would you think about what the right way to approach this is in a large enterprise? I mean, there's no right way. It's like, you know, teaching someone how to walk for the first time. There's no right way other than just 
moving your left, you know, one foot in front of the other. And I think it's really about starting small and building momentum, showing success, promoting success and building momentum. But, and here's the key thing, this is super important. If the executive leadership team, CEO, C-levels, mid-level managers, if they are not all bought into that, it will never work. Full stop. There's no such thing as grassroots transformation. Never happens. You're going to run up against one of the organizational boundaries and it stops. And so you really have to have the entire leadership team at the top all the way down aligned behind that outcome. And that's not always true in most in many companies. Yeah, I, um, I will refrain from making extended <laughs> comments on that one. Um, but so it's true. It's not just true. It's true at every organization. Everybody is like, it's like asking someone who do you, do you want to lose weight in January? You're like, everyone's like, yes, I want to lose weight. I want to be in the best shape of my life. I'm going to run a marathon next year. And they're like, great. Here's what this looks like. You're going to have to change the way you eat. You're going to have to exercise every day. You need to run every day, three miles a day. You got to lift weights. Everyone's like, Hmm. Yeah. Isn't there a pill? <laughs> yeah, I hear you, but surely there's something I could do like one day a week, right? Like, can we just like cut it down? And the same is true of the transformation work too. It's like, hey, you're gonna have to fundamentally change the way your entire organization is structured. Every team gets hip impacted. HR, IT, all of your technology back in services, the way every business unit works has to change. You have to change your communication patterns. You have to change the way you um, incentivize people, which changing your OKR structures. You have to change your, uh, the way you, uh, what, how your bonus structures are, how people are incentivized to work. You're going to have to change all of that. And everyone's like, yeah, you know, that's hard. Just, just, is there, just give me that silver bullet tech that I can throw in and solves all my problems. You're like, well, it doesn't really work that way. Well, so if you're a tiny company and you're starting fresh, like a startup, then, you know, um, you know, then things might look different. So I want to sh shift gears and ask you, you know, cause you advise and invest in a lot of startups. How do you approach advising them? Like how are their decisions made in an early stage going to shape what kind of adult they grow up into? I mean, some do and some don't like I do, I do advise a lot of startups not to overthink too much. Cause what you don't want to do is like, okay, I'm going to spend the next two years building the most perfect MVP possible so that it, so that I've achieved, so I've addressed every outlier, what this is going to scale like if there's a million nodes and what it looks like if there is 7 million customers and what ends up happening is you tend to over-engineer and you spend far too long. So early days, particularly when you're trying to get for MVP, which is for those of you that are not familiar with the language, the minimum viable product which is what you wanna get out the gate to give in the hands of customers or also known as design partners to give you feedback to make sure you're building the right thing. You wanna go fast and loose early on. Just you wanna, cause at the end of the day, you're not gonna to live to raise your next tranche if you can't get something out the door. And so you have to really focus on what is the minimum viable product I can deliver. And you should make technology choices commiserate to that. So you wanna make technology choices that allow you to as quickly as possible, ideally without inventing it yourself where you don't need to, leverage quick technology that you can access quickly, spin up, scale out fast, but recognizing that your technology, whatever you're building is going to have to evolve pretty dramatically over the coming years. You know, fingers crossed if you're successful, and you get a lot of customers and you start to scale it out, you want to make sure that you can scale it out. You want to make sure that you can iterate quickly on the code that you have. You want to make sure you're not locking yourself into too poor of technology choices that you're going to have to rebuild things in a year because that wouldn't be great. And so really thinking through both speed, but also optionality and flexibility in your choices. Thanks, Abby. Well, okay. To, before we transition over to Daniel at Mithril, I want 30 seconds of when you look in your crystal ball for technology, what do you see coming, including like how you think about it as puppet or just in general? 
oh, there's so much coming. Oh, it's such a bad thing. There's so much happening right now. Um, infrastructure is being quickly rewritten. Automation is quickly scaling out and doing more. There's gonna be a huge uptick next year and the year after in low code, no code to address those growing skills gaps. Um, I am becoming increasingly more interested in what Web3 is doing, particularly the developing ecosystem for developers and around smart contracts and blockchain. Um, I think there's a ton of applicability in Web3. And, you know, that's not even touching on where Edge is going and, um, you know, quantum computing one day, if it can pull out and we can see that increase in uh, support for qubits, then we could have something really interesting there in the next couple of years. So there's a lot happening. Just pick a, just pick a lane and it's, there's something going on. Well, thank you, Abby. It's really great having you here. And, uh, you know, Skydeck is really lucky to have you as an advisor. Um, really appreciate you and thanks for uh, coming. Thanks for having me. And we will shift gears. Uh, I guess, Anthony, I'll hand it back to you.